And today I will uh, uh, tell you something about uh, how to use uh, viral reporters uh, to study uh, HIV infection. So this is my favorite virus, uh, and uh, now uh, viruses are very fancy. So I hope you will enjoy something that is not SARS-CoV-2, but still uh, uh, really interesting to me and very close to my heart. So. Just a very brief introduction about HIV, because understanding its uh, biology is important to understand how these uh, reporter viruses work. So human, the human immunodeficiency virus is a lentivirus that belongs to the family of retroviride. It contains two copies of a single-strand RNA that codes uh, for all the viral genes. Inside the virion, you will find also three enzymes that are necessary for uh, the early steps of infection. These enzymes are the reverse transcriptase, the protease, and the integrase. HIV is sur surrounded by a viral envelope that is composed by a lipid bil uh, bilayer taken from the, uh, from the cell membrane of, of the uh, infected cells. And the viral envelopes contain the viral glycoproteins that will mediate infection. These proteins are the GP120 and the GP41. Uh, so, again, just a brief introduction on how the genome uh, of HIV is organized. Again, it is necessary to understand how the, the reporter works. So, the organization of HIV genome is, I would say, pretty simple compared to other viruses. So, it is, as I said, a single-strand RNA virus, and you will have the LTR, that is the viral promoter, it is repeated at the three prime end. Then we have a GAG gene that encodes uh, for uh, the, structural, the structural proteins of the virus. Then you have the pole gene that will encode for protease, RT, and integrase. You have a bunch of accessory proteins that I will not go into detail right now. And then you have the envelope that, as the word says, encodes for the envelope of proteins. Then you have NEF and other accessory proteins and the repetition uh, of the LTR. So the HIV life cycle starts uh, when a virion, uh, the, the GP120 uh, and, and GP41 on the surface of the virion, interacts uh, with specific uh, cellular uh, membrane proteins that are CD4 and CCR5 or 6CR4. These are uh, chemokine receptors that mediate the entry of the virus. So the virus uh, GP120 and GP41 mediates the attachment uh, to the cellular cofactors and the budding, the, the fusion of the envelope with the, the cellular membrane. At this point, uh, the uh, single-strand RNA is retrotranscribed by the RT that is brought by the virus. You have the formation of a double-strand DNA that enters into the nucleus, is integrated into our own DNA, so HIV becomes part of our own genetic makeup. And at this point, uh, all the viral genes are transcribed by RNA pole 2 and the cellular machinery, transcription machinery. The unspliced and spliced mRNA are exported into the cytoplasm. They are translated into proteins by our ribosomes. And then the virion is assembled and can bud from the plasma membrane. Also here, it looks very complicated, but I will not go into the molecular details of reverse transcription. But as I said, it's important to understand that the RNA that constitutes the genome of HIV is reverse transcribed into a double-strand DNA here. And then this double-strand DNA travels to the nucleus, it enters uh, through the nuclear pore, and thanks to um, 
interaction with cellular cofactors, here, for example, it's a uh, LEDGEF, it is uh, uh, targeted to sites of open chromatin where active genes are. And then it is integrated into our own uh, genome and can be transcribed. The transcription of the viral genes is strictly dependent to the cellular transcription machinery. Indeed, uh, specific uh, transcription binding sites are present on the LTR. Here you can see sites for NF-kappa-B, NFAT, SP1, and TBP. All these transcription factors are cellular transcription factors that binds to the viral promoter. They recruit RNA pol 2 and also thanks to TAT, that's the viral protein, transcription starts. And then you will transcribe, you have the transcription of all the viral genes. One very important feature of HIV, and this is the main reason why HIV cannot be really cured, is that uh, HIV integrates into our genome and, become, and can become latent. So here, if you see uh, you know, the curve of, of infection, in the early phases, you have a peak of iremia here, and then you can have uh, uh, this virina can be, be stabilized by our own immune system for some time or can be uh, kept under control using antiretroviral drugs that work really, really well. However, if you stop taking antiviral drugs or after a few years uh, without antiretroviral drugs, you will have again, uh, blip in viremia, and, and the virus becomes replication uh, act active again. So HIV latency, it's, uh, uh, as I said, the major obstacle to HIV eradication and cure. Because when the virus becomes latent, it cannot be uh, purged, it cannot be seen by our immune system. Latently infected cells are completely invisible to our immune system and, and to all the drugs that we have available. So this virus stays silent for a very long period of time, and then it can appear again. So how this latent reservoir arises, uh, there are several hypotheses, but mainly since the, 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 the intrinsic nature of the cells uh, infected by HIV, it has been uh, hypothesized that HIV infects uh, memory, active memory CD4 T cells, that then become resting and shut down all the transcription, shutting down also HIV transcription, thus becoming latent. So the majority of cells that are infected uh, will die, of course, for the cytopathic effects of the virus or because our immune system recognizes them and kills them. But then a very small part will revert to a resting state and then the virus becomes silent. However, when this cell will be reactivated, for example, by... Uh, meeting, uh, uh, by, by recognizing a specific antigen or by cytokines, uh, another infection, then this virus will start to uh, uh, transcribe again. So the molecular mechanism of HIV latency are uh, uh, very different. It can be uh, unavailability of transcription factors, uh, repressive uh, chromatin structure like mm, post-translational histone modifications uh, uh, or uh, um, transcriptional interference uh, due to read-through of RNA pol 2 and also availability of other factors like the elongation factors PTFB. The problem, one main problem also to understand how to eradicate and how to study this latent reservoir is that CD4 T cells are a very heterogeneous population. There are 
many different subsets with different functions uh, at different phenotypes, different features. And here I just showed you the very, the, the, the easiest way to, to recognize, uh, to uh, characterize uh, CD4 T cells from the naive, so a T cell that has not encountered the antigen until the effector that is the more differentiated T cell. These cells uh, have uh, di different uh, differentiation status and also a different self renewal capacity. Naive and CD4 T stem cell memory are the less differentiated and also the ones that have uh, a higher self renewal capacity. All these cells have also different susceptibility to HIV. For example, naive T cells are very resistant. Uh, however, they can be react they're very resistant to infection. However, some uh, HIV can also infect naive T cells, and those cells can also be reactivated to produce new virus. The CD4 T stem cell memory uh, are a very small population, but those are important because they are more permissive to HIV. It has been shown they contribute to the persistence because they uh, have a very high self renewal capacity, a very long life and they can differentiate in all the other subsets. And it has been shown that over time, their contribution to the reservoir increases because their half-life is so long. All these cells can also expand through clonal expansion that is uh, uh, more um, frequent in uh, central memory and transitional memory. However, effector memory are also very important because they are the most susceptible to infection and the most easiest to reactivate even though their half-life is uh, uh, shorter. So from uh, what I said uh, uh, to you, I, I hope you understand how complex it is to characterize how HIV establishes latency in CD4 T cells because of all these different subsets and, and the difference uh, uh, how they respond to infection and, and to reactivation of the virus. So in order to uh, study how uh, HIV establishes latency in all these different subsets, uh, we can take advantage of fluorescent viruses. And this is called HIV JKO. Uh, that means uh, uh, HIV green Kusabira orange virus. It has been uh, developed uh, by the lab of Eric Verden in uh, 2018. And the features of this virus uh, are the following. So as you can see, the structure of HIV genome remains. Here you can see the LTR, you have GAG, you have pole to make the virus. However, here you can see that envelope is not present with deleted envelope, so this virus is not replication competent. It is able only to do one round of infection. You are going to pseudotype this virus with a VSVG or another envelope in order to allow infection, but this is not a spreading infection. And here, in place of the viral protein NEF, it has been cloned a cassette containing two different reporters a GFP and the Kusabira orange. So here you can see the GFP is under the control of the LTR here. While the Kusa, in front of the Kusabira orange, it has been cloned a cellular promoter that is EF1 alpha. This means that when you infect cells with this virus, you will have this situation. You will, when the uh, viral transcription is active, you will have cells that express both GFP and Kusabira orange. Here you can see double positive cells that express GFP here on the X axis and MKO here on the Y axis. And you have and also cells that express only the Kusabira orange. This means that these cells have been infected, the virus is integrated into the, viral, into the host genome. However, expression of the viral proteins is not present because you have no GFP. But the cellular promoter is of course active and then you have expression of MKO. So we can say that 
all the cells that are MKO positive and GFP negative, here in the red rectangle, are latently infected CD40 cells. Here. So, how do you do this experiment and how do we prepare the sample? So, first of all, we isolate CD4 T cells from uh, buffy coats, from peripheral blood of uh, healthy donors, healthy blood donors. Cells, uh, CD4 T cells uh, are then uh, magnetically selected from, uh, to isolate them from all the other uh, uh, leukocytes that we don't really care. These cells are stimulated with cytokines to increase their susceptibility to infection and to make the infection uh, more efficient for um, three to four days. And then cells are infected with HIV JKO. Then uh, six, uh, five, six days post-infections, uh, cells are stained for, uh, to look for viability because some cells will die because of infection and you, you want to exclude them from your analysis. And then you will stain also with surface antibodies that will allow you to discriminate among the different subsets that are infected. And then you analyze those cells by flow cytometry. So first of all, as I said, you will do a viability staining. What is a viability staining? Uh, is basically um, a staining with a dye that is able to enter uh, only dead cells because the integrity of the membrane of, of dying cells uh, is compromised. So this dye will enter in these cells and make them fluorescent. So we, you take all your CD, infected CD4 T cells. Uh, here is a mix, mixture, so you will have uh, green cells uh, for active uh, infection, the red cells, they will be latent, and then you will have a lot of uninfected cells. You pellet those cells, and then you incubate uh, in the dark uh, for 10 minutes at room temperature with the, this viability dye. You can choose uh, the, the fluorescence of your viability dye based on your antibody cocktail, uh, and, and, and there are a, a wide panel of viability dyes available, basically in whatever color you want. Then cells are washed and incubated with uh, antibodies that recognize specific uh, um, molecules on the surface of the different subsets. So at this point, again, you have uh, your green cells, the red cells, uninfected cells, and then a bunch of apoptotic of dead cells that at this point will be fluorescent. You mixed uh, your, uh, your cells with the different antibodies. And here, for example, there is a list of the antibodies I use. So uh, in order to discriminate naive stem cell memory, central memory effector, and transitional, I use five different antibodies, and then the combination of these five will tell me what cell uh, I am looking at. For example, naive T cells will be positive for CD45 array, will be negative for CD445 RO, negative for CD95, positive for CD27, and positive for CCR7. On the other hand, uh, stem cell memory, again, will be positive for all uh, the markers except the RO. Stem cells memory are negative for CD45 RO. All the memory parts, central, effector, and transitional, are negative for CD45 RA, but are positive for RO. And CD27 and CCR7 are necessary to discriminate between effector uh, memory and transitional memory. Uh, and central memory, of course. Central memory are positive for both CD27 and CCR7. Effector memory do not express neither CD27 nor CCR7, while the transitional memory will be positive for the 27 and negative for the CCR7. So you mix uh, all these antibodies uh, together and then you incubate the cells with this mixture of antibody, again, in the dark, for around 20 minutes uh, at 37 degrees. Your way to stain cells can vary. For some uh, markers, you, you can do um, RT, 
in incuba incubation at the room temperature, some at four degrees, it depends on what you are looking for. And then you will go to the flow uh, to the fax, uh, and what are you gonna see? So first of all, you are gonna gate for the uh, physical parameters. So here you recognize your cells based on FCA and SSCA, and then you are going to exclude your dead cells. As I mentioned you before, the dead cells are going to be fluorescent because the viability dye is uh, uh, inside. Uh, these apoptotic and dying cells, so you will have to gate only on the negative cells. These are alive. Then you want to exclude doublets, and what I do, I use uh, uh, the CD4 antibody, and basically all my cells, almost all my cells will be positive because I pre-selected them with magnetic beads and FCW, and these bunch of cells uh, will be excluded because they are doublets and you don't want them in your analysis. At this point, so you have excluded the dead, you have kept only CD4 singlet cells, and you can see the how your infection uh, was. This is uninfected. As you can see, there are no uh, MKU positive cells and no GFP cells. And here are the infected. Again, here you can clearly see latently infected cells that are positive only on the PE channel, and then uh, the infected cells uh, that are positive for GFP and PE. So at this point, uh, you can also uh, ask the question, what are the infected cells? How is this pool of infected cells uh, uh, composed. And you will use uh, the staining uh, uh, with the antibodies that I showed you before, so array, RO, CD95, 27, and CCR7, to gate the different subsets. So first of all, you will gate for cells that CD40 cells that are CD45 array positive, but CD45 RO negative here, or cells that are positive for CD45 RO, but are negative for CD45 RA. So let's go with the RA positive, RO negative first. Then here you will gate them for cells that are positive for CCR7 and uh, CD27. Uh, and then here you will have the stem cell memory that are positive for CD95, uh, while the naive are here and they are negative for CD20, CD95. When you look at the memory pool, you take uh, the CD45 RO gate, and then again, it's CD27 against the CCR7. You can clearly see three populations, one, two, and three. These are the central memory that are positive for both, here in the uh, upper right quadrant. These are the effector memory that are negative for both here in the lower, oops, in the lower left quadrant. And here you have the transitional that are positive for CD27 and negative for CCR7. Now that you gated for all these different populations, you can look at the infection inside the single gate. So here you take your central memory and then you plot the GFP against the PE. The same you can do for the effector here and the same you can do for the transitional here. Same thing for stem cells and naive and you can get for productive infection and latent, productive infection and latent. And what you can see from uh, uh, these infections is that the central memory effector memory and transitional are very susceptible to infection with around 20-25% of cells that are infected. Stem cells are less susceptible, while as you can see here, the naive are very, um, are highly resistant to infection. You can also, of course, plot the latent infection. And as you can see here, latency is, is higher in effector memory and transitional as uh, uh, raw values, 
but also in uh, CD40 stem cell memory. At this point, you can also use uh, um, another feature of, uh, of Flojo to visualize in a different way uh, the gates that I showed you before, to have uh, um, a more um, homogeneous uh, uh, way to see all those data. And to do that, you can use a TSNI plot, and these plots, uh, uh, as has been uh, beautifully explained yesterday by uh, Dr. Lully, they cluster cells that have similar features. And you can also overlay on these clusters uh, the productive and the latent cells. So what I have done here, for example, is to do uh, to cluster cells and then overlay the productive and the latent uh, infection to see where it is. So as you can see, the productive uh, here in green cluster in specific areas of this plot. So here, here, and here for this donor. In this donor, they are more clustered in this uh, region of this Disney plot. And we can say that maybe the, uh, we can see that latent cells in red, the red dots, are more uh, heterogeneous. So they have, the, there is some cluster here and here, but still you can see red dots also where uh, green dots are almost absent here and here. So it seems that the latency is more scattered throughout these populations while the productive is more clustered. So what are these clusters? Then you can overlay the populations. So in green, you have naive T cells. In red, the stem cells. Blue, central memory. Orange, a factor. And in purple, you have the transitional. And in black, you have the infected cells. So let's see total infection, so green and red together, latent and productive together. Here you can see a big cluster all on the effector memory here. You see that is, there is orange underneath all this black. Central memory and transitional that are more susceptible. Same thing here. The majority of the infection occurs in this part, uh, in this region of the TSNI plot that uh, represents uh, effector, transitional, and central memory. If we look at the latent infection, you can see that there are dots also in naive and stem cell memory. So there is not such a uh, big cluster, but all these uh, dots are scattered through all these populations almost uh, at, at, at the same level. And another virus, uh, another fluorescent virus that I want to uh, talk about uh, is uh, replication competent. So again, let's go back to the genome. Uh, if you remember the genome of the GKO, had a red cross here on the envelope, and I told you that that virus was replication incompetent. You need to pseudotype. This virus is a replication competent. It means that it infects the cells, and then cells will produce new virus. This virus is different because you still have NEF, so this is a complete virus. Nothing is deleted. You have env, you have NEF. But the GFP is cloned after NEF using an iris. So all the infected cells, productively infected cells, will be GFP positive, will be green, and you can monitor uh, infection uh, over time because this virus replicates. So as you can see here, these are CD4 T cells from uninfected to day three and day five, uh, the infection uh, increases because this virus replicates. One particular thing of these viruses, if you are going to use them, these samples must be fixed in PFA 4% uh, 
uh, for 30 minutes or 4 degrees before analysis because this is an infectious sample and you cannot go to the fax machine with an infectious sample uh, if it is outside the BSL-3. If you have a fax inside the BSL-3, then you can uh, do a live uh, uh, analysis. If your fax is outside, remember those samples need to be fixed with PFA to kill the virus, very important. And with this virus, uh, uh, one thing that you can do, for example, is to study infection of uh, different uh, uh, immune cells. Here I can show you an infection of uh, uh, MD disease, monocyte derived dendritic cells. These cells are highly resistant to HIV infection, HIV-1 infection, but are susceptible to HIV-2 infection. And this is because a viral protein contained in HIV-2 but absent in HIV-1 counteracts the restriction factor named SAMHD-1 that block infection. So if you add VPX to HIV-1, you restore completely uh, infection of disease. Here you can see these are uninfected. These disease are infected with a regular HIV-1, basically no infection. You add VPX and here uh, you have half, almost half of the cells that turn green. And thanks to this virus, we can also study how HIV is transferred from DC to T cells, because another way to infect C4 T cells uh, for HIV is called transinfection. HIV can be captured by disease and presented or, or used to transinfect CD4 T cells. So again, I want to remind you that in case of uh, uh, HIV-1, uh, MD disease are basically resistant to infection. However, they can uh, pass, uh, uh, they transfer, they can transfer the virus to CD4 T cells. And again, to do that, you can, uh, to look at that, you can plate your disease, you can pulse with your uh, GFP uh, replication competent virus, then you will wash away your virus and then you add your T cells. You will wait uh, a week more or less to uh, allow the virus to spread, to grow and replicate and then cells will be stained with the CD3 in order to recognize only the CD4 T cells. Again, fix these samples and you can get only on lymphocytes and check the GFP expression. As you can see here, CD4 T cells that were pre-incubated with disease will express, uh, with disease pulsed with HIV, will express uh, the GFP because the virus has been transferred from the DC to the CD4 T cell. So, and with that, uh, I want to uh, thank INGM and uh, uh, the guys that did the experiments, especially uh, my PhD uh, student Giacomo. And I am happy to take any questions about how to use uh, uh, fluorescent HIV to uh, study your favorite uh, question about viral biology.